Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 5 and 6 say you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your mind and with all your might and these words which I give to you today shall be on your heart the first essential the number one essential to prevent yourself from hindering your kids from coming to Jesus is that you and this goes for all of us whether we have kids or not the number one essential for all of our lives is that we must be in love with Jesus ourselves period we can't pass on you cannot pass on to your children what you don't possess we must invest the time uh, dating Jesus so that we fall in love with Jesus and this is only accomplished by reorienting your life by by even being willing to to have your whole mindset shifted around Jesus John Mark Comer who is an author out on the west coast he wrote contrary to what many assume Jesus did not invite people to convert to Christianity he said, Jesus did not even call people to become Christians. Please stay with me. Just hear this out. He invited people to apprentice under him into a whole new way of living, to be transformed. Comer writes, my thesis is simple. Transformation is possible if we are willing to arrange our lives around the practices, the rhythms, and the truths that Jesus himself did, which will open our lives to the power of, of God's change. Said another way, folks, it's this. We can be transformed if we are willing to be covered in the dust of our rabbi, Jesus Christ. That we are walking so closely that the dust that comes off of Jesus' sandals is covering us. Then and only then can we become the people that we, that we ache to be and to live the lives that we were created to live. Parents, are we ready to reorient our lives? We should be willing to do it. All of us should be willing to do it, it just for our own relationship with Jesus, just for our own salvation. But, but are we willing to reorient our lives for the salvation of our children? To do nothing that will, that will hinder them from coming to Jesus. I'm gonna be honest with you. If we aren't willing to do this first essential, if we aren't willing to do this first essential, then the other three essentials that I'm going to share with you won't matter at all. They won't matter at all. Because if we do essential two, or we do essential three, or we do essential four, but Jesus is not in our hearts, our kids are going to know, and they're gonna see the phoniness of our faith and our phoniness will drive them away more than anything else. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And these words which I have given you today shall be on your heart. There's no equivocation there. There's no, as long as you show your kids and say things about Jesus in your home, then it'll be okay. Before Jesus tells parents, teach them when they get up, teach them when you eat, teach them when you walk, teach them when they go to bed at night. Before Jesus says any of that, he says you and me, we have to love Jesus with all of our hearts, all of our hearts. Now this can be challenging and it can be discouraging, but I wanna remind us of something. I wanna remind us of something. God makes a beautiful promise to every parent and every person who's not a parent. We're reminded in the book of Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, where Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You ever feel tired as a parent? I do. As a grandparent, worrying. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, Jesus says. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want my kids to have Jesus in their life, but the only way I can do that is if I go and learn from Jesus myself. If I go and be with Jesus myself, 
And then, and only then, will my kids truly be able to see in me, Jesus, the hope of glory, the only way to life. So let's start there with our heart. That's the first essential. And I pray that that will be your prayer. Even right now, if you just say, Lord Jesus, I haven't been committed to you. Take my heart right now. Just right now, Jesus can do that. He can begin to work that process out in your heart right now. But let's move to essential number two. And these next three essentials are based on, on research that's been done. Uh, I went to a conference, Pastor Larone invited me with uh, some of her children team, children's team to go to a, a children's conference. And I thought, I, I went with the expectation of I was going just to support her and the teammates to be a good you know, uh, head pastor and say, I'm just going to support my team. But man, I learned a lot of stuff there and it was really good. And some of these things I'm sharing with you are some of the things I learned there, the research that I learned there that they shared with us. And this is the essential number two. Individuals that grow up and say, yes, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. They report, they report that their family was consistent. Listen to that word, consistent in weekly corporate worship. Weekly corporate worship. What do I mean by corporate worship? I, I don't just mean dropping your kids off at, at Sabbath school or Sunday school. I mean our kids with us. This is what they meant by this research. Our kids with us in the gathering of God's people to sitting together, worshiping together. That is what they report that helped them to, to say yes to Jesus. This was the number one essential they gave in this research. Chuck Lawless, he's considered kind of an expert on trends in, in church movements. What a great name, Lawless, for a guy that works in the church. So Lawless, Chuck Lawless said, he said that he's seen, this was just written less than a year ago. He said that he's seen a growing trend away from segregated worships by age and a return to family style worship. And he says, why is this? Why? Well, according to Josh Mulvihill, it's a hard name to say, so I'm just going to call him Dr. Josh. According to Dr. Josh, who's a children's pastor at a mega church in Minnesota and has his doctorate in children's ministry, he says that kids who are not worshiping with their families in a corporate worship service, the studies are showing, are growing up and growing out of their age-specific worship areas and leaving the church at a much greater rate than those who sit with their parents and sit with the body of Christ of all generations in a corporate worship service. This is why churches are moving away from this. Just like the Adventist church, just like other churches, they're losing their kids, but they're losing them at an even greater rate because of these segregated worship services. Dr. Josh says the most important hour of the two hours a child spends at church for their long-term development, not, not for some of the immediate things and some of the, 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 the things they're learning, but for their long-term development of faith is sitting with their parents in church. Sitting with their parents in church. You may say, well, pastor, my kids get nothing out of the sermons. Some of the teenagers have told me, pastor, we don't like your sermons. That's what you gotta love about kids. They're honest. They tell you. My son last week, you know what he said to me after I was done with my sermon? He said, yeah, I got lost in your sermon. I didn't really pay attention, Dad. Gotta love the honesty of kids. Gotta love it. My kids get nothing out of your sermons. Or they don't get anything out of church. It's not their thing. It's not their style. But you know, that's not true. They do get something. You know what they get? They get to see their parents sitting there and participating in the worship of the one true God. And that is an influence that goes beyond the words of the pastor. That is an influence that goes beyond the style of music. That is an influence that they say changes their lives. Think about this. Many studies have been done that show us that if the, the kids up here who, who from birth, basically, this is what study, the research says, that from birth, 
their parents read to them. That, that a child who from birth is read to on a regular basis, that that child is more likely to grow up and become a, have the habit of reading themselves than those who were not read to on a regular basis. This, this, is, this is research that's been done and, and almost no one argues with that correlation. Yes, kids that are read to at a young age on a consistent basis, that's the word consistent again, they grow up, they're more likely to become readers when they grow up as well. And everyone says, yeah, we see that correlation. But for some reason, when it comes to, to spiritual things, we go, oh, I don't see the correlation. Why, why me going to church every week? Why does that have anything to do with my kid saying yes to Jesus? Why do I have to be there in church? I can just drop them off. No, there's a correlation that goes along with this. How about this one? This is from the National Institute of Health, NIH, just down the road from us. We have a lot of musical people in here, and I chose this illustration because I knew that we'd have our band here with us today, Lisa. I knew that they'd be here, so I chose this illustration for this. NIH, you know, they do all kinds of research, medical research. They, they do research about mental health. And something that they've discovered is that, is that people that sing and play instruments have, it improves their mental health. Right, Miss Lanning? We know this to be true. We know this to be true. So they're looking at this and they're wondering, and they're saying even into adulthood, it helps people that are adults. If they continue to play their instruments, if they continue to sing, it improves their mental health. It improves their mental health. What they're finding though, is that of the people that play instruments as a child or sing as a child, when they grow up, about 50% continue playing and about 50% stop playing or stop singing. So they, so they did research and they said, why is this? Why, why do 50% start and, or stick with it? And why do 50% stop? Because they want to know because they want, of course, to increase the number of people that stick with it because it helps mental health. So NIH is looking at this. And here's the things that they discovered. The number one thing that they discovered, the earlier a child is introduced to music, on a, here's their word, consistent basis, the more likely they are to stay with it. Pa Pastor, I'll bring my kids when they're older and they can sit still in church, but till then I just, I think the correlation is the same. The earlier we get our kids coming to church and on a consistent basis, the more likely they are to stick with it. The next thing, if they have many family members who also make music, they are much more likely to participate in music into adulthood. So in other words, if they have a family of people around them that, that shows the value of music, then they're more likely to stick with music as they become adults. Well, mom and dad, grandparents, If you surround your kids in church every Sabbath, they're going to say, man, this must be important to this generation, to this generation, to this generation. This must be important. I better pay attention to what this means for my life. There's a correlation, I believe. Here's what else they found. They found this. As kids, and I'm going to put in a word that they didn't put in, but it seemed to be implied in my heart at least. As kids, were forced to attend concerts and sit quietly and listen more frequently to music, they were more likely to stick with it than those who quit. And the reason why I say that I think this is, this is forced a little bit because my son's taking violin and his violin teacher will say, is he listening to his music? And she says, I can see the difference when he's listening to his music. And you know what she's secretly saying to me? Chad, are you being responsible to make sure that he's listening to his music? And I'll say sometimes, sometimes I'll say, well, we haven't done as much. Sometimes I'll say, yes, we are listening to book one of Suzuki violin over and over and over and over again. That's why I say forced. I don't know if it's forced on the kids or forced on the parents, but it's forced on someone. But supposedly by doing this, by them just listening to music, even if maybe they're not getting something fully out of it, they're more likely to stick with it as they grow up. And then surprise, surprise, the kids who were, and again, their word, 
most consistent on a weekly basis in their practice are more likely to stick with music into adulthood than those that don't. Here's the thing. This is the way God made us. We begin to take into ourselves and it becomes a part of us that which we consistently do. If I'm hit and miss with my kids in worship, they are more likely to be hit and miss as adults. They are. We accept it in every area of life that there's correlation between what happens when they're young and the habits that they create when they're young and what they do when they're old. And yet, yet, yet I think Satan puts these blinders on us and goes, well, maybe this won't matter so much. As long as I send them to the right school or do this or do that, I don't need to make this a priority. That's the second essential. Families together in corporate worship. Essential number three, according to the studies, they report that in their family, there was the consistent habit of family worship. We worship in church together. We worship at home together. You know, this is the one that, that corporate or that, that we sometimes have struggles with in our home. I'll admit that. All my kids read their Bibles daily. Christy and I read our Bibles daily individually, but we struggle sometimes of being that consistent daily uh, study time together. Before we leave our house in the morning, we do this prayer time, my, my sons and I, and the goal is to do it before we walk out the door. But sometimes we, we miss it. And, and so we're in the car and, and we go through our prayer uh, liturgy, as I would call it, uh, there in, in, in our driveway. And sometimes we're pulling out of the driveway and I remember and I stop. This last week, I'll be honest with you, we were halfway down Ed Norview Road, our house, and I stopped the car in the middle of the road and I put it in park and I said, wait, boys, we forgot our prayer. We got to do our prayer. And so we did our, our prayer together. I, I checked in the rearview mirror to make sure there was no one behind me so I wasn't inconveniencing anyone, but we did our thing. But sometimes it, it, it feels like this struggle. Sometimes the kids seem really into it. They, they enjoy it. And sometimes they just seem so annoyed that dad is making them do this again. And you go, what is the purpose of all this? You know, the greatest opposition to a consistent family worship is never starting. That's the first major objection. But the second thing is that we start and then we fail and we go, ah, this is just too tough. We start and our kids are slouching and grumbling and muttering. In, in the love of Jesus, I'm sure, although it doesn't feel like it. They're looking at their watches like we all used to do. Is Sabbath over yet? Is worship over yet? As you may be doing, is the sermon almost over yet? And we go, oh, is this worth it? If you ever feel that way, I want you to remember this great, great quote from G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton said, if anything is worth doing, it is worth doing poorly. Did you hear me? If anything is worth doing, it is worth doing poorly. There are some things in life, folk, that we just need. We may not be very good at them, at it, like speaking English. Uh, or proper English or whatever it may be. But there are just some things that we, we need to do anyways. I think of my uncle with this. I have an uncle, most of my family is quite athletic, but I have an uncle who, I don't know what happened to him, but, but his, his athlete apple fell far, far from the tree. And he was not an athlete. He was not good in any way, shape or form. He, he just is not athletic. And he didn't do athletics as a kid because he was not any good at it. He has a brother that was very good at it. Uh, his older sister, my mom, was very good at athletics. My dad was quite a workaholic and was busy. My mom would go out and play catch with me and she could throw super hard. My kids have played catch with her and they're impressed. Grandma can catch the ball just like any old dude, like boom, catch it wherever it is, throw hard. And, and so he just, but he was not athletic. But, but get this, his two kids are amazing athletes. 
My cousin Chantel, she was one of the top 25 tennis players in high school in the entire state of California. She went on to get a full ride to college. She's in the top, she went to Fresno State University and she's in the top 15 all-time uh, wins at Fresno State University in tennis. She went on from there to become a tennis coach at a Division I school and also to pr play professional women's football. Yes, I said that right, professional women's football. It's called the Women Football Alliance, and it is legit. I have been to one of these games, and these ladies hit hard. Man, it is intense. But my cousin, she... 2019, she was the MVP of the league of the Professional Women Football Association. 31 touchdowns to two interceptions. They lost, unfortunately, in their Super Bowl to the Boston Renegades. She's a team from California. Go ahead, look it up. It's legit. You can even watch the whole game online. She's a great athlete. Her brother, her brother was a starting forward for NC2A division school, Fresno Pacific University there in California. He was a starting forward there for them for four years and got his degree there. How did this happen? How did this happen? Of course, some of this is genes. There are, there are athletic genes in the family, but my uncle who isn't an athlete, who was not any good at sports, he didn't hit a tennis ball well, he didn't shoot a basketball well, but it didn't keep him from trying because what was worth being done in his mind was worth being done even if he did it poorly. No matter what the genes were, if my uncle had not been willing or had said, you know what? I'm no good at this, so I'm not going to be a part of this. I'm not going to invest in this. I'm not gonna take my daughter to the tennis court and hit the balls with her. I'm not gonna go out to the driveway and shoot baskets with my son. If he had just refused to do any of that, his kids would not be in the position that they are now. Show up for family worship. You struggle, show up again. You forget for a week or a month or a year, show up again. Get back to it. And then finally, number four, this is in the research. This isn't, I know you all know that I'm obsessed with uh, connect groups and I love Michael that you've started your new uh, bird watching connect group. So if you're bird watchers in here, I don't know anything about bird watching y'all, but we got all kinds of groups in this. So Michael, thank you for starting a, a bird watching group. And I know the multi-generational there as well, interested in that. But here was the fourth essential, the third essential from their research that they found. They found that families that, that worship together in corporate worship, families that worshiped at home together as a family, and families that worshiped in small groups, as they call it, intergenerational small groups, reported that those kids were more likely when they became adults to say yes to Jesus than those that didn't. There was something about that intergenerational uh, small group that blessed people. So I'd encourage you, gather some families, start with people you know, gather some families around and invite them into your homes, into your lives to help mentor your kids and for you to be a mentor in their kids' lives as well. Christine and I have done plenty of things wrong in our parenting, but one of the things I'm sure we've done right is investing the time in being a part of a multi-generational connect group, as we call them here at Spencerville Church. Such environments are where I see 1 Timothy chapter 4 happen. You know, 1 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul was writing to young Timothy, and he said, let no one look down on you because you are young, but, but set an example to all believers in your faith, in your love, in your purity, in your conduct. When I'm in that group with those young people, they are setting an example for us. And there are so many times I've, I've literally started crying in the group watching these young people fall in love with Jesus and set an example for Jesus. And hopefully likewise, we as the older generation are also fulfilling the call of Titus too, to be mentors to the younger generations. There are times when I don't feel like having our group and I don't even know if our group is going well, if we're doing the right things or I'm tired. We have church many times after, or group many times after church on Sabbath. And so I don't know if, if I really want to do it because I get tired preaching and then I got to go home and, 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 and be with people even though I love my group. There's some of you in here. 
But Christina's reminding me, and I've heard her say it to other group members as well. She said, Chad, we do this for our kids. She said, we do this for our kids. She said, one day they're going to grow up and they're gonna leave our house. She said these exact words. She said, they're gonna grow up and they're gonna leave our house. They're gonna go to college or they're gonna be in a church somewhere. And someone is going to come to them and say, will you be a part of our small group Bible study? And she said, I hope when that happens, they remember how much they enjoyed small group at church and it will help them to say yes to that God moment. In other words, what she's saying to me is, Chad, we invest the time. We make this decision with the hopes that one day it'll help our kids to say yes to a God moment someday in their lives. That's what all these four essentials are about. Parents, none of us want to hinder our kids from coming to Jesus. But if we're not intentional in key investments of time, our own personal worship and walk with Jesus, that, that we don't have divided hearts. Divided hearts, parents, do not equal devoted children. Our hearts are surrendered to the Lord. That, that we make the essential of corporate family worship together with the entire body of Christ a, an important piece of our lives. This helps them in making that decision for Jesus. That we have family worship on a consistent basis and that we're a part of multi-generational mentoring within a small group, a connect group as we call them here. Intentionality in these key essentials won't guarantee and is not an absolute that your child will say yes to Jesus. But maybe, and studies seem to affirm that it will help, that it will help. Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. When our kids get to Jesus, what they do with Jesus's love is going to be their choice. Just as when you get to Jesus as an adult, what you do with Jesus's love is your choice. Just as when I get to Jesus, what I do with Jesus's love is my choice. But let's do everything we can to get them to the lap of Jesus. And hopefully when he lays his hands on them to bless them, they're so overwhelmed by his love that they can't help but say yes to Jesus. Let us make every decision in our lives as parents and as a church family to help our kids fall in love with Jesus. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, hit the like button here, subscribe to our page for future videos, or for the next video, click the box right here.